You positive heads, welcome to a very special episode dedicated to none other than you, the pea heads themselves. I am your pea head enthusiast and hostess for the day, Alexa Hauser. I have been blessed to have the experience of helping out with Positive Head social media for the better part of a year. And through my digital interactions, I began to realize, as did Brandon, that we have some incredible beings listening to the show who are taking the information that Brandon puts out through the podcast and using it to transform their lives and create wonderful things. You listeners are all a huge, huge part of the life force that propels this show forward through time and space and we think it's time to bring forth some of you beautiful reflections and delve a little deeper into this collection of energy that is the positive head community so as we shine the spotlight on our listeners what we'll have them do is share their stories of how they attracted positive head into their life the transformation it's facilitated for them and what they're focused on creating now that they're in a more positive head space Also, this episode of the Positive Head Podcast is being brought to you thanks to the support of Gaia. If you're not familiar, Gaia is the go-to source for streaming consciousness content online. And you can sign up for your first month for only 99 cents at Gaia.com slash Positive Head. That's spelled G-A-I-A dot com slash Positive Head. Check it out. Hello, all you positive heads. On this week's Pea Head Posse episode, our guest is positive head listener Jonathan Fink. Jonathan is the author of the book, The Baseball Gods Are Real, a true story about baseball and spirituality. Jonathan is also the president president of Satya Investment Management, a purposeful investment firm based in Leewood, Kansas. Jonathan earned his undergraduate degree from Tulane University in New Orleans and his MBA from the University of Missouri in Kansas City. Hi, Jonathan. Welcome to the show. Alexa, great to be with you. Thanks so much. (laughs) Absolutely. It's great to be with you. I've actually spent the past few days reading uh, your amazing book. Congratulations on this. Um, The Baseball Gods Are Real, a true story about baseball and spirituality. I'm looking at it right now. It's First of all, it's a beautiful book. I don't know who designed it. Did you say you you self-published it? I did self-publish it. I created my own publishing company called Polo Grounds Publishing. And by having to do that, I had to literally learn the entire publishing process myself, which meant hiring a book designer and an editor and a book layout designer. And so, yes, so I had a lot of help. I did not design that cover myself. Oh, well, you picked the right people because it's gorgeous. Like the whole time I was reading this book, I was like, wow, I just love this book. It's so yeah. pretty and well done. And Well, shout out to Meg Reed. She did a great job. <laughs> Good job, Meg. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, well, why don't you, um, you know, before we get into all of that, why don't you give just the listeners kind of a brief background of, you know, yourself? Actually, I mean, that is in the book as well. But why don't you give people yeah. a background of yourself and kind of how you got to this point of, of writing this book? Sure. Well, well. First of all, I started. I, I'll start with my family. My wife is Reggie. We've been, we've been married for gosh, almost twenty years. Nineteen year anniversary is coming up. We have two beautiful wow. children, uh, Kayla and Nate. Kayla is fourteen, a freshman in high school, and my son is at twelve, and he's a, he's in middle school. And uh, both ama- amazing children, super old souls, and um, just very grateful to to uh, be their father and, and be Reggie's husband. Um, my book is a really good summary of the first part of my life, which led me to where I am today. Uh, but essentially. I've had a lot of hobbies uh, throughout my life. I've always loved baseball. Uh, I've always been interested in martial arts. I've always loved music. Um, This book is a story about how uh, when I was a little kid, frankly, I I took uh, martial arts and I was in an old school dojo where we learned how to meditate every day in class. And so as a little child, um, literally in fourth grade, I was meditating, you know, several times a week. 
And I never really understood the power of meditation until I gave it up. And essentially, uh, you know, throughout high school, I had a, you know, a, a great childhood and I went to Tulane University from an undergraduate degree. Um, and then I ultimately worked in the music industry for, for a number of years. Uh, I then went back to get my MBA at University of Missouri in Kansas City. Uh, and then ultimately, uh, was a financial advisor at Morgan Stanley for 13 years. And I, I loved Morgan Stanley, a great firm, very proud to have worked there. But there was something inside me that was yearning to start my own firm and, and go independent and do things on my own terms. And so, um, and so that's what I did. So I started my new company, Satya Investment Management, a few years ago. And, um, and that really is the, fir- the first part of the story. Um, when we moved from New York to Kansas City, um, my wife grew up here in Kansas City. And so we first moved, um, I lost a lot of clients because I was no longer that New York person. I wasn't local anymore. And, um, and then in the time that I was in, working in, in Kansas City, uh, I lost more clients. And it really took a toll on me emotionally. And I felt this you know, burning desire desire to, to break loose and start my own firm, but I wasn't sure if I had any clients to come with me. And I sort of had this Jerry Maguire moment. I'm not sure mm. if you remember the film, but he holds oh, up it's his, one of my favorites. His, yeah, yeah he, holds, he holds up that bag with a fish in it. He says, who's coming with me? And I heard, <laughs> and I heard, I heard crickets. <laughs> you know, and you know, Morgan Stanley's a, a very well-established firm, and I was starting on my own, and so maybe people didn't have confidence in in trusting if their money would be safe or whatever the reason was. And I had to really make the decision to to go and whatever I go with the flow, and whatever happened happened. And so I decided to to uh, to start my own company, and and that was really part of my rebirth. And and the shocking part was that the majority of my clients did not come with me, and so it, it really, frankly, I like to say it led to a, a mini midlife crisis because I had all the success for for many many years. Um, at one point, I think I had over. 150 clients. I was managing over $60 million at a very, very young age. And when I started my new company, I basically had to start from scratch. So it really uh, set me set me into a whirlwind of emotions, and I had to really search my soul. And you know, at some points, I was even one. You know, had to re- revisit, you know, where I wanted to take my life. But I realized I really do love investing, and I really do love helping people. And uh, you know, all the great sages of the, of the world they always talk about the idea that that suffering is a prerequisite for for enlightenment. And, and maybe that's true. Maybe we have to have physical or emotional suffering, and 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 go through that and burn through that suffering, maybe burn through that karma. And then on the other side of that um, is, uh, is the light. And so ultimately, that, the, the story of, of my book is how um, my life temporarily fell apart and how I put it back together. And I put it back together with, with yoga first, uh, and then by rediscovering meditation. You know, it's interesting. The, the yogis say that when you meditate, angels swirl around you and beckon to help, but you must ask for the help. And so when, when you're, you know, they say there's no atheist in foxholes, Alexa. So, so mm-hmm. the truth is I was at a point in my life where I really did need help. And I, and through meditation, I started to pray and through prayer and meditation, I started to experience uh, synchronicity and wings from the universe. And then ultimately, ultimately miracles started to happen to me. Um, and, um, and so now, uh, now, uh, now I have a book to book to share and, and writing books is always something that I've always wanted to do. I used to write uh, music reviews in college and, and so it came very naturally to me and I basically Basically, you know, when people have a midlife crisis, the, the cliche is they go buy a sports car. So I didn't buy a sports sports car, but I, I wrote a book instead. And then what I realized is that uh, this the story was really touching people and and really hitting home. And a lot of the themes in the book really resonated with people. And I realized that um there's more to tell with my story. And 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 as I started to meditate more, I, you mentioned today in one of your uh, Facebook posts about the I- idea of downloads. I started receiving downloads. And so literally, I now have three more books to write about baseball and spirituality. And I also plan to write a book about, about music. And then probably I'll finish it up with a book about investing as well. Um, but to, to make, the, make the book compelling, um, what happened to me was when I turned 40, I became a vegetarian. And um, I started eating at Zoe's Kitchen every day because they had healthy food. And the, the guy behind the counter, it became a joke that he knew my order every day. And, and this tall kid with a beard and a smile on his face, he and I became friends. And it got to the point where... Um, he knew my order every day. And after about two or three weeks, he would notice me, you know, dressed in my post workout from yoga class. And I'd be reading my research. And he finally approached me and asked me what I do for a living and what I do. And he asked me, hey, listen, do me a favor. Every day you take your research, you throw it out. Don't throw it out. Let me have it. I love to read it. I I think investing is fascinating. And it's a hobby of mine. Um, This kid told me he was pre-law and recently out of college. And so I, I was happy just to help him. And and just by simply the, the pure joy of helping somebody else, maybe I was starting to uh, spark uh, the, the, the laws of attraction and, and the laws of karma because there's something very powerful about you know, selfless giving. 
And, and by doing so, we became friends. And ultimately, uh, this, this kid behind uh, the counter, his name is John Perrin. And after two months of becoming friends, we went out for a cup of coffee. And then he dropped a bomb on me and told me he's actually not a uh, – he is at Zoe's Kitchen, but he's actually working three jobs this offseason because he's actually a professional baseball player. And, and that's really where my story uh, gets a lot more interesting because the baseball gods came back into my life in a very, very big way. And now I take them with me everywhere I go. In fact, right now I'm here in LA uh, on my second stop in my book tour, and I'll be going to the playoff game tonight with the Brewers and the Dodgers uh, tonight and tomorrow night. And I'm, I have some meetings to uh, promote the book and, and to explore actually possibly making a movie. So exciting. And I can totally see how it could be a movie because it's, it's truly like you are such a beautiful writer. Um, it felt it was so effortless to read this book. I'm not 100% done, but I'm getting close to being done. And I sat, I actually read um, almost half of the book just in one sitting because I just oh, sat wow. down. Yeah, I, I, I tore through it. And um and it's funny, too, because you and I actually have some similarity. Like, I worked in the music industry for a while as well. And you re- mentioned about Almost Famous and how that was like a, you know, yeah. a, and uh, that movie has always just hit me so hard and just resonated with me so much. But anyway, um, you know, what I what I love besides and I want you to get into like a couple, uh, you know, other you just mentioned one of the synchronicities, but I know there's more than that. Um, and uh, I just the baseball gods are real. I just have to say like when I, when this came across my email and then when I even got the book, I was just looking at it thinking, man, I just love, I just love that. Like you're someone who's taking this approach. Like you're someone who's very much into baseball and sports and are bringing this spirituality component to it because I think it is illustrative of the fact that you know, you call it the, your term for it are the baseball gods, right? Like that's yes, how you yes. refer to it. And I, used it to, I used to say universe. Now I say the baseball gods. Yes. And I love that because it's like, it's, you know, I was thinking about how I was like, man, you know, like sports is very kind of spiritual in certain ways, especially baseball, right? There's so like with superstition oh, oh, yes. and ritual. And can you like speak to that a little bit? Just yeah, about well, you're, at, you're actually tapping into a very interesting thing because the book that I wrote here, the baseball gods are real was not the book that I intended to write. Um, the mm-hmm. book that I intended to write, I still plan on writing. Uh, the, the, the next book I'll release is called The Road to the Show, which is really a continuation of this story of, 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 of my journey and then John Perrin you know, getting involved in my life. And of course, my son and my daughter, uh, they, they, you know, they're kind of characters in the story too, if you will. Um, but um, the second book is Road to the Show. It's the continuation of, of the first book. Um, and that might be the movie itself is those first few books. However, the, the initial book that I wanted to write was called The Religion of Baseball. And I still plan on writing that. And that book literally is exactly what you're describing. Uh, the baseball superstitions, uh, the rituals, um, baseball karma, uh, the unwritten rules of baseball, the rules of the baseball gods, and how these different elements weave into the game. Because the truth is, this book, Alexa, uh, let's be frank, baseball is a Trojan horse, right? The book's really about spirituality. And it's almost mm-hmm. like most people who are not spiritual, if the, they wouldn't be interested in law of attraction or karma maybe at this stage in their life, but when they find a book about baseball, because they love baseball, they'll read it. And then from there, they'll get opened up to all these concepts like karma and the law of attraction. You know, the, the idea that your mind and your body and your spirit are connected, the power that yoga and meditation can bring to your life, the idea that reincarnation is a real possibility. And if it is a real possibility, well, then how would that change the way you live your life? Um, so yeah, so for me, um, I still will be definitely writing that, that book, The Religion of Baseball. And I try to, uh, you know, there's, there's certainly elements of that in, in that first book, but there's, there's more, there's much more to, to, to tell. And that's really a, a nonfiction research-based book. And then the fourth book I'm going to write is called The Game of Baseball, all under the umbrella of the Baseball Gods of Real series. And that's kind of my way to kind of give back to the game of baseball. And my, my hope is that, that that book will be an idea about, you know, think of it this way, 25,000 people in the history of the world have made it into the major leagues, right? And so the idea that every kid growing up and every little boy or girl who says, I want to I become a pro baseball player, it's not even a one in a million chance. It's like one in a, a billion or a trillion. But just because when someone gets to high school and they hit that ceiling or they get to college and, or even rookie ball and they find out, you know what, my, I can't hit it hard enough or I can't, my curveball doesn't curve, curve enough, my fastball's not fast enough, they hit that ceiling and then they have to give up their dream of becoming a baseball player, which is what happens to most people. But just because you can't become a ball player does not mean you cannot have a career 
in baseball. The idea is if we are passionate about things, those are the careers we should be pursuing. Uh, I just think about how many YouTubers there are now that literally play video games on YouTube and are now are millionaires because they're, they're, they're following their passion, they're playing video games, and they're sharing that with the world. It just proves that whatever your passion is, there is a career for you in that passion and the money will follow. So the idea with, with baseball, with the, the religion of baseball book and then the game of baseball book, the, the religion book is to focus on all those esoteric things that we see in our daily life, but put a, a microscope on them in the world of baseball um, to really open up our minds. With the game of baseball, that's really me kind of paying homage to the game itself and showing people, you know what? You could be a general manager. You could be a scout. You could be the usher. You could be the umpire. You could be the trainer. You could be the, the, the dietitian. You could be the team therapist. There are so many jobs in baseball, and there, there's really something for everyone. And so the point of that book is to show people that whatever your dreams are, follow them. And if you love music, then pursue a career in music. But if you love baseball... It's not just about being a baseball player. There are so many different jobs. And, um, and, and pe- when, when I go around and I, I speak to ushers and I speak to the beer man, they love, what, they love their life. They're having fun. They're living their life to the fullest. And so the goal of that book is to show people that follow the law of attraction, follow your passion, and you will find uh, what you're looking for. You'll find contentment. You'll find success and happiness. And believe it or not, the money will follow too if it's meant to in your life. Mm, yeah, I, I love everything you just said there, especially about the – or like about the the baseball being the Trojan horse, you know, for this book yeah. of because I really felt that and I was like, wow, this is so that's that's exactly what I was, you know, complimenting you on is just like the 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 way that you told the story of spirituality and of synchronicity uh, through baseball, and I love that of of all the the plans for the future books and. Um, so actually, you know, there is a point in this book where you do get like kind of you you do a past life regression, right? Yeah, I've actually done two now, and, and I'm happy to discuss them with you. Yeah, yeah. I would love to talk about that. Yeah, so, well, uh, go ahead. Yeah, the, the, the first past life regression is actually in the book, and that's the chapter called the Hank Greenberg Experiment. Uh, interestingly enough, tomorrow night I'm going to the, the, the Dodgers game with author Kathy Bird and her son Christian Hopp. And they are two, you know, they're light beings. They're two amazing, amazing people. And Kathy wrote a book that I recommend to everyone called The Boy Who Knew Too Much, the true life story about how she discovered that her son Christian may in fact be the reincarnation of the famous baseball player Lou Gehrig. And when Someone I read that just book, told me about this. Wow, that's crazy that that's come yeah. up two times. Someone just told me about this. Go ahead. Fascinating. Well, it's an, yeah. ama- it's an amazing book. They're an amazing story. But when I read that book, it really was the final moment that inspired me to write my book and share these personal stories with the world. And I had to take a step back and say, you know what? Um, I hope she's telling the truth because I, I know my story is all true. Um, I'd love to meet her and, and see for myself. I'd love to meet this kid and see for myself. And so, so one of the synchronicities that happened that I can get to, you know, to, as a preamble to that is, is ultimately my mother-in-law threw a surprise birthday party for her new bo- uh, boyfriend and, and had a uh, surprise party at Dodger Stadium in a suite. So last August, we knew we were going to LA and I thought, you know what? Now's a good chance to reach out to Kathy and introduce myself, see if I can meet her and get some advice about book writing and then meet this boy and see if he really is something special. And the day after the game, well, first of all, a synchronicity happened when we were at Dodger Stadium for the party. Uh, my son and I were ball hawking. Ball hawking is an expression for trying to catch balls during the game or during batting practice. And um, I had just caught my first ever home run ball uh, off a of bounce. So it wasn't a pure catch, but it was close enough. The baseball guys literally almost like bounced the balls so would come to me. It was incredible how it <laughs> happened. And of course, my son was 14 rows above me. And so I threw him the ball because it was a gift for him. So I was only hawking to, to help him hawk, you know. Mm-hmm. And ultimately, as soon as I caught the ball, my daughter, um, she was on a tour with the group. They just got to the suite where the party was going to be. And basically, Christian Hawk, when he was in preschool, he's the first boy, preschool boy ever, to throw the first pitch out of Dodger Stadium. And the, that picture of him uh, at Dodger Stadium became the cover of Kathy's book. So sure enough, I catch this home run ball, and then I get a FaceTime from my daughter, and my daughter's Kayla says, Daddy, and she turns the, face, the, the phone around to the wall of the suite. She goes, is this the boy you're meeting with tomorrow? And on the wall was a picture of Christian Hopp throwing out the first pitch. It was the picture from the cover. And I thought, wow. what are the odds? There's only there's 34 suites in the, uh, in the whole stadium. Apparently, only two of them have the commissioned picture from the AP. So what are the odds that I would be uh, in that suite? And so I got to that suite and, you know, my hair was standing up on my arms and, you know, I just, uh, it was just the most surreal experience. And of course, Kathy was not even aware that that, that picture was even in that suite. So that was my, my first wing from the universe that I'm on the right track pursuing this, this author and her son. But interestingly enough, when I, when I called Kathy or emailed her rather from the suite, 
it was, it was the reverse for her. For her, it was spirit confirming that I was being sent to her as well, as much as me was, you know, she was being sent to me. So ultimately, the next day, I, my son Nate and I, we spent the entire day with Kathy and Christian, we, and we went to his baseball practice. And I can tell you that as an eight-year-old boy, he was by far the best baseball player at eight years old that I've ever seen in my life, still, still to this day. And of course, now that he, Christian is 10 years old and we've become personal friends and we, we, we speak all the time, of course, we're going to the game tomorrow, just to kind of give your, your readers an update, um, just a, a three, I think three months ago in the last season, uh, Christian pitches first complete game no hitter and wow. i don't know if you know much about little league baseball but it's very rare for a kid to pitch three or four innings at a time let alone pitch a full six and have no one get a hit off of them so he he, he he's the real deal for sure <laughs> and so our friendship has continued and of course um you know kathy's been such an inspiration to me and so helpful to me on this path and so when i knew i was coming out here and for one day to promote the book and then i stayed an extra day because i got some meetings i thought you know what i'm gonna ask them to come join me at the game and, and, I'm, and i'm gonna see them tomorrow well anyway kathy found out in her book through her past life regressions that in fact um three different past life regressions that she found out that she was Lou Gehrig's mother in, in all three of her regressions. And so when I, one of the connections that I made with Christian was that as soon as he got, he set eyes on my son, Nate, they immediately become best friends. And my son, uh, you know, he's an old soul for sure. We, I named him after, you know, Nate after my grandpa, Norman, whose real name was Nathan. And uh, I used to always joke that my son is my reincarnated grandpa. And of course, my grandpa Norman had a very tough life. At age 13, he grew up in the Bronx, as did Lou Gehrig. Um, he never got to finish high school, he never got to go to college. He had a full-time job at age 13 because his dad passed away. And he had a mother and several sisters to support. And so I always joked that, you know, my grandpa Norman had a really tough life and died early. Well, now he gets to come back as my son and, and go on these baseball god adventures and have the most, you know, you know as, much as, as much magic as I can create for my kids, I'm, I'm trying to do. And so he gets to come on a lot of our baseball god adventures and um and when i realized that there's this connection between christian and my son i thought you know what um maybe my son's a reincarnated baseball player so ultimately uh i, I was I, I was at the i was doing an outdoor yoga class last august for the eclipse and when it was time the class was over it was time to put on your your, your eclipse glasses and lay down on your back and watch the eclipse there was this woman who was in my yoga class who i've seen for months and months and months but never said a word to her and it was time to everyone to lay down and watch the sun, you know, watch the eclipse. She laid down and cuddled next to the yoga instructor. And I thought, oh, well, I wonder if they're dating. It turned out they're married. I had no idea. That afternoon, the eclipse was so powerful and so inspiring. I just was compelled to go to my laptop and type into Google, Leewood, Kansas, past life regressionist. And the first link I clicked on was Silent Synergy. And I clicked on it, and whose picture was there? It was the woman, Kirsten Harwick Mills, who is the uh, the wife of uh, of Brad Elper, the yoga teacher. And so I, so I so I knew this was the woman that had to be the person for me to do my regression. And so of course, when I, I met her, I said, "Kirsten, uh -huh. I want to go back to 1938. You know, I want to find out if I was Hank Greenberg's father, because Hank Greenberg and Lou Gehrig were both from the Bronx, and they were friends, and they were rivals. They had a very interesting friendship and kinship." And she says, Jonathan, slow down. You can't tell your soul where you want to go. Your soul's going to take you where you want to go. Just let it flow and surrender to the flow. And so I did. And ultimately, um, that was um, the Brian. There's more than one type of past life regression technique. That was through the Brian Weiss technique. Um, as opposed to the Dolores Cannon technique. I've now done both. But the first time was Brian Weiss. And essentially, um, I only went back to one past life. But as surreal as this may sound, I went back to the 1800s. And I was a farmer uh, living in Kansas. And I lived, on, I lived all alone in this little uh, log cabin. And I, the vision I had was um, looking over these wheat fields. And behind them were these beautiful sunflower fields. By the way, I, I didn't even know that sunflowers was um, of such a such a stereotypical part of Kansas. I, I, and it's a sunflower state. It never even occurred to me at the time. I'm from New York. <laughs> I've only been living in Kansas for a few years. But I had this vision of these wheat fields and a sunflower field, and there was trees to the left and trees to the right, and, my, and a hill to the left, and my house was behind me. And the sun was coming down in a beautiful sunset, and this, this image was just so, so powerful. And when I, when I awoke, my, in the book, I say how scientifically the experiment was a failure because I did not go back to 1938. I couldn't prove that my son or I were Hank Greenberg or that, you know, I was Hank Greenberg's father the way that Kathy was Lou Gehrig's mother. But, you know, past life regression therapy is very, very powerful. And 
the takeaways are, are, are life-changing. And ultimately, the takeaways were like, you know what? The science experiment itself was a failure, but they were such a huge success because I now understood why I'm so comfortable living all alone. I'm now understanding why I have arthritis. In the past life, I had throbbing hands of arthritis pain as I was overlooking my wheat fields that, I had, that were ready for a harvest, and I felt this sense of pride and, and accomplishment. And, my, and that's, it goes back to that baseball god um, idea of the game of baseball that you, know, you could be the usher or the general manager. You could be the farmer or the farm owner. It doesn't really matter. about. It's more about how you live your life and living it to the fullest. And you can have a very, very rich life no matter what your job is. Um, in fact, I just, had a, I just had an Uber drive and it was the most happy Uber person I've ever met. And because he just loves <laughs> what he does and he's, he's filled with, with love and light and it's, and it's beautiful. So yeah, so the first past life regression uh, was going back to the 1800s in Kansas. And maybe I would just tie it all together because... Uh, I've recently had a, a vindication validation that, that Alexa, we have not discussed yet. Three weeks ago, my parents were in town from New York visiting, and my wife and, and I wanted to have fun activities for them when they were in town. And so my daughter and my, and my wife planned to go to the Westport Art Fair on Saturday uh, and then go to a sunflower field on, on Sunday. I've never been to a sunflower f- flower field in my life. And we were at the Westport Art Fair and we were ready to leave. The last booth we see, I see a painting and I grab my son, I'm like, Nate, come look. It is literally a painting of the vision that I had during my past life regression. There was the wheat fields and the sunflower wow. fields, the tree to the left, the tree to the right, the sun coming down. I said, Nate, this is it. Now, I wasn't smart enough, unfortunately. I was so, I was so overwhelmed and emotional. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. I had chills the whole thing up and down my spine. I wasn't smart enough to buy the painting for $200. I just should have, but what I did do <laughs> <laughs> we'll take a picture. Take, we'll take a picture of it, and also the label. And the label said Leavenworth County, Kansas. And I thought, wow. oh my goodness. The next day, where do we go? My, my my wife said, let's go to go to Lawrence, Kansas. Let's go to this sunflower field in Lawrence and take my parents to University of Kansas to see the campus for the first time. And Lawrence, Kansas, is in Leavenworth County. And so sure yeah. enough, I, I, that morning, I put on my Hank Greenberg jersey, and I just told my wife, I said, Reggie, I'm telling you, I just know, I have this knowing this is going to be the place. And I said, Reggie, my, now my wife is, a, is a, a healthy, pragmatic skeptic, right? She, she's my yin to my yang. She balances yeah. me out. And so, and so she was giving me this kind of rolling her eyes look. I said, Reggie, I'm just telling you, if there is a weed field in front of a sunflower field, this is the place. And so we got in the car and we, we drove, you know, 30 minutes northwest on our way to, uh, to, to Lawrence and we got to Leavenworth County and went to apparently what is a very famous sunflower field and it was in full harvest and, and unbelievably so right there was a wheat field and a sunflower field and the tree to the left, the tree to the left, the tree to the right, it was all there. This was the place. And I walked with my father all the way deep into the sunflower field, and it was just the most incredible thing. And I even went back a week later by myself when I had more time. I went at sunset. And um, wow. So in many ways, now I look at the Hank Greenberg experiment as a, as a major success because I've now been able to validate myself now and vindicate myself that this really did happen. And I really did live there as wow. you know, someone who believes in reincarnation. It seems, well, you know, someone in India would say, well, of course you lived there before. You yeah. know, most people who, who don't believe in this stuff, they would say, well, this book is, is, a, is a nice, you know, a nice fairy tale story, Jonathan. But now when I write book two, um, they'll have to stop and think, wow, maybe there's something something to this. Um, and then sure enough, I did do another past life regression with Jerome DeWitt. Jerome DeWitt was the gentleman who did Kathy Bird's three past life regressions. And when I was in town in LA uh, a, f- a few months ago, I saw him and, um, and, and that one was even more, more intense. It was much longer. That was the Dolores Cannon method. And in that, uh, that one, I didn't go to just one life. I actually went to four different past lives. And this will also, I'll certainly write about this um, in, the, um, in my second book. But, um, but yeah, it was, this one was really far out, Alexa. In one, in one past life, if this may sound preposterous, but I was, I, was this, like, I was this like alien. I was this like bug-like alien living on this planet that looked like it was suffering after the consequence of like a nuclear war. There was just nothing there. It was just like desolate and dark and depressing. And I lived in this little cave and I ate bugs for a living. And it was this horrible, miserable alien life. It was not, I I could not wait to get get out of that dream or that, that past life episode. Um, The second, the second, this, yeah, it was, it was surreal beyond beyond surreal. I I couldn't have, I would have liked to have come from the Palladium, something pretty like that, but it was, or serious, but it was some dark planet and it was not a happy place. And there was no life there. I was all, all alone. And by the way, in my Hank Greenberg experiment, I was a farmer. I also lived 
Uh-huh. All alone. And of course, in my book, I mentioned how when I used to be in the music industry, I would go scout bands and go to concerts all the time by myself. When I first mm. moved to Kansas City, I mentioned in the book, I would go to b- baseball games all the time. I, I first moved here. My wife was in law school. She was busy. I had no friends. I just moved here. I went to b- baseball games all the time by myself. I never thought twice about that. I'm always very comfortable in my own skin. Now, of course, I feel like when I'm by myself, I'm never alone. I'm with all my angels and all my spirit guides. You know, the <laughs> baseball guys are always with me. But back then, I always felt that sense of comfort and Never felt alone, but I just didn't know why. Well, anyway, mm. the um, the second past life I visited was really amazing, and I basically flew in the clouds from uh, from from where from where I was, and I wound up in basically Montana, where I was a native Indian. Um, I don't know what 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 period of time it was, but essentially, I was I did know this: I was born from parents that from two people that were not my parents, i e like two young lovers had a baby, you know, and there was no protection back then. They were native Indians. And so Mm. I was basically raised by the tribe and I lived in this little hut. It was like, it had like, um, dirt on the ground. And essentially, um, I, uh, your own took me to my death. And in that death, I died as a very young boy. I believe I had some kind of disease that they had to get rid of me. Otherwise I would have, uh, I would have given this disease to everybody else in the tribe. And I wow. literally uh, was put on a bed of fire and I was burned to death. And on wow. uh, in, in my memory, I'm this little boy on this bed of fire burning to death. And I got to tell you, I felt no pain. I felt that my soul was being released and set free. It was a wow. surreal past life vision because no one wants to suffer. Um, and when someone is, is dying, if they're dying because they've been suffering and if, and when they're ready to die, death is actually, a, could be actually a very beautiful thing. When people die prematurely, it gets a little, gets a little more confusing and then you have to deal with karma and other issues. But in this life, I was ready to go. I wanted to go. I didn't want to hurt anyone else in my tribe. I didn't want to feel the sickness anymore. And I wanted to be set free. And I guess mm. back then, the, the only way they knew how to burn or get rid of the bodies in a safe way. I mean, even in India to this day, they burn bodies. So it's still, you know, cremation is yeah. a very common thing. They do it right on the rivers. So, so I was burned, basically not at the stake, but I was burned on a bed of fire. And that was an absolutely surreal past life. And then the, the you, third one I'll mention, because wait, I have a it question. Was, I have a question yeah, not sure. to cut you off. Yeah, do you, sorry, I'm on, a, do you, I'm on a run. No, yeah, you're on a roll. I, I don't want to mess it up. But um, do you remember in the life as the boy, did you know that you, that uh, you were eternal, that like you would come back? Or do you know if you knew that? I know I, I didn't, I did not recall that. Um, okay. memory, but the knowing was in that memory, um, and maybe because you're, you're channeling that boy at the time, you know, that version of me. And so that person, that, that Native Indian boy didn't maybe believe in reincarnation per se. Right. But what I did sense and feel was that there is an afterlife of some kind. There is a heaven or a dimension beyond this reality that I was going to. And mm-hmm. I could not wait to get there because I knew when I got there, it would just be pure love and bliss. So wow. I was in this fire that's burning literally this kind of hellfire, yeah. and I was ascending, like my spirit was leaving the body, and it was going to a place of pure love and light. So I didn't know if I would come back again. I just knew I was going to a, a better place. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah, okay, totally cool. surreal. It's, and, and even to talk about it now, it just seems so bizarre. But, but yeah. yeah, that's what I envisioned. The, the third one I also share because it seems so fitting. And here I am in LA. I'm on this book tour, reporting my first book. Well, in this third life, I went back to the medieval times, and I, I wasn't sure if I was in Scotland or Ireland or England. But I was living in this city state where it was one of these, like literally, like a king and queen had their castle, and the, the entire city is fortified by walls. And I lived my entire life inside the confines of the city state. I never left the walls of this this community. And in that lifetime, I was I was a young man, and I was an author, and I had this idea to, to write a blasphemous religious book. I don't know what the topic was, but I knew that the powers that be, whether it was the church or whether it was the crown, they weren't going to be happy with it. And I almost knew that after I published it, I'd be put to death for, for writing it. And wow. I got to the point where I was in this little house, again, by myself, a very small place, not that dissimilar from the hut where I was, was an Indian or this little cave where I was when I was this kind of like insect alien thing. But um, I literally would write my book with a feather and an inkwell by candlelight. And by the way, if you look at my Polo Grounds publishing logo, you'll notice it's a baseball player holding a feather, an inkwell, right? Because yeah. that's how yeah. I guess I, 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 I created that logo before I knew about this past life. But essentially, I was prepared to write this book, even if it meant death. And I had this tremendous sense of pride and joy because I knew if even one person gets to read this book, it's going to change their life. And if you just change one person's life, that would have been enough for, for, for losing my life in that journey. But it also made me realize in this book, you know, the book that I, I just published, my goodness, I'm writing about 
reincarnation, all kinds of esoteric stuff that frankly, if I wrote this book 200 to 300 or 1,000 years ago, it probably would have been considered blasphemous uh, back then. Where now we live in a, time, a, day, a day and time where look at your podcast, look at the topics that are discussed. It's, it's incredible the things that you're able to discuss and free speech is alive and well. And we live in a, an age where we have these freedoms. And I, and I also still, I'm, I'm hoping and praying for a golden age to come for all of us where we can truly, truly live fully free. But yeah. essentially in that third life, being that author, it really connected with me in this life because up until a year ago, I wasn't an author. I was just a money manager and I was just a president of my own investment firm and I was happy with that life. And as I took on this new persona as Jonathan Fink, the author, and, and I knew the books I'm going to write about, even when I eventually write books about investing or, or about music, there will always be a spiritual component. And I recognize those spiritual um, components can be controversial. And, I, and just like today, I felt compelled to do it, even if people don't resonate with it. I know that people will, and it's worth writing it, including any backlash I get because I feel compelled, compelled to do so. So it's come mm. full circle. The fourth story, and of course my favorite number is four, so maybe it's only appropriate that I had four, but here's where it gets very surreal because in my fourth, my fourth life, um, I was working in a, a textile factory as an accountant. And it turns out that my, my great grandfather um, was an accountant in a textile factory. And by the way, Hank Greenberg's father also um, did financial accounting and, and worked in factories and um, in the Bronx. And in, in that life, I was working in, in, the, you know, in Manhattan, in New York City, in the Bronx, working in this kind of sweatshop factory where all these old ladies were working on sewing machines and stuff. And I was doing some accounting. And then I got into my car. I, I drove some kind of like a, a Model T Ford looking car. And I drove to Yankee Stadium. And I went to the game by myself. And I was there to watch uh, Hank Greenberg's debut at Yankee Stadium. Now, Hank Greenberg, of course, played with the Detroit Tigers, but his first time back in, in the Bronx was at Yankee Stadium. And of course, I can't prove in that past life that I was Hank Greenberg's father, but if you were a, a Jewish man growing up in the Bronx, and back then, of course, there were very few Jewish baseball players, and unfortunately, less so today, but back then, there was tremendous anti-Semitism. In fact, Hank Greenberg cannot go a day in his life uh, at a ballpark without being verbally abused by sometimes his own teammates, certainly the other team, and of course the other fans. But the point is, if you were some, a Jewish guy, you know, watching Hank Greenberg make his debut, you know, the prodigal son returns, you would feel this sense of pride and joy. And I was, and I was basically there and I watched him uh, make his debut. And so I still can't prove that I was his father or that I was Hank, although I don't think I was if I was there watching Hank play. But maybe I, I was someone in my own family who um, reincarnated and back then had a love for Hank Greenberg. You know, as as did, for example, if you were a Jew in Brooklyn in the 1960s and 50s, you loved Sandy Koufax, who played for the Dodgers. In fact, right now I'm actually wearing a uh, a Sandy Koufax jersey to kind of pay homage for, for my trip here. So, <laughs> so that fourth life was really powerful because it, it it brought it brought it home to to baseball, and for the wow. first time, it brought the idea of Hank Greenberg. Um, into my past life sessions. And so I'm still on this journey and I'll probably do many more past life sessions because it's so powerful. And again, the takeaways are, you st I'm still learning from them now. I'm still having new epiphanies and the light bulbs are still going off constantly as I reflect back on these different past lives and try to understand, was it just my subconscious? Was it, was it just my imagination? Was it really a glimpse of a past life? And if it was, what can be learned and, and derived from those past lives to make this life the best life that I can make it and to live this life to the fullest? Wow. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's deep, uh, I know. I love thank it. you for sharing that. I love, you know, I find that so interesting. I'm actually about to do one as well in like the coming weeks. Um, Exciting. And, uh, and the, your third life, the third life you shared about um, what was it? Oh, about yeah, writing the writer, the medieval times. Yeah. Yes. That resonated so deeply with me while you were describing it. It almost like I almost started to shake because that's something that I, I feel so strongly about with myself right now mm -hmm. about like, you know, we are heading into this amazing time. I feel right now, like even, even with all the things that are going on right now, like I still look at it as, wow, things are really changing. Things are really moving. And like, we're moving into a really good place, even though if you choose to focus on, you know, whatever's in the political climate, you can it might, focus on it. I yeah, think you it can means, focus it's, on it. It's like birthing pains to me. I think this is birthing yes, pains to exactly, the new age. Exactly. Yeah. All the, all the stuff has to come up before we can like, you know, move forward. That's right. So, yes. um, so, but, but what you're talking about, about feeling this, 
because it's like with me, you know, I, I host one day a week on this podcast. I have my own podcast this three days a week. That's all about the stuff and even more like, you know, we're <laughs> always doing like readings and channelings and all kinds of things. Beautiful. And it's like, and, and I love it, but there's something in me that's like, oh no, this is wrong. You're going to be like excommunicated. Mm, there's something yes. that constantly keeps telling you that you're going to be excommunicated. Everyone's going to leave you. Everyone's going to, or you're <laughs> you going to, you're in danger. In life. <laughs> probably, yeah, sure. probably. Right. And it's, it's possible. It's, um, but you know, it's, kind of cool to think like you know maybe we all were and like maybe we all wanted this like all of us who are here doing this now kind of on the front lines of this we're all finding our own unique way to kind of um redeem not redeem but like it is yes yeah recapture who we've always been yeah and actually live it out in a way where we're successful and actually live it out in a Go ahead. Yeah, there, yeah, yeah, it's almost like there were there were always steep consequences for trying to be yourself yes. to speak to speak freely, and now we're entering a time where you can you can stay in your truth and express your truth, and from that is a tremendous freedom. And when you feel that 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 feeling where you you're not you're not you're you, you're not allowed to express yourself, or the fear of repercussion by doing so is not worth doing it. That's not that's not a living a free life, and and your soul yearns to be free and. You know, maybe in the past we've yearned to be free and we've tried to be free and then we got punished for doing so. Yeah. Um, and now in this life, um, we're, there, there are no consequences. We really can let, you know, let your love light shine, if you will, for real. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And um, man, I just, it's, yeah, yeah, no, it's, it's really exciting. And you're like, your energy is like really exciting me about it. So um, I feel, I feel really like blessed to connect with you in this way. And Same here. Um, <laughs> Well, so let me ask you this. What is one thing that you think would benefit every positive head listener to know or understand as they continue on their own journey? Yeah, that's a great question. I have to say that giving yourself to others is magical. The idea of not just necessarily volunteerism, although that that is beautiful and very important, but helping others comes back to you in what I call asymmetrical ways. I mean, just take the example of John Perrin. He was this young kid who had passion and enthusiasm, and I loved his, you know, his zeal for life, and I wanted just to help him selflessly any way that I could. And I wanted literally nothing in return. Just the giving was the gift in and of itself. Mm-hmm. And what's, what to come full circle, as you know from my book, um, when I was at Morgan Stanley, I, I felt this yearning to go independent, and my father-in-law had won a, a charity auction to play golf with two professional baseball players, Joe Carter and Joe Randa. And after playing around a round of golf with these two guys, you know, they were humble, they were they were funny, they were they were smart. Um, they also retired and have lots of money. And I thought, you know what? I should manage money for baseball players. It's a great fit for me. I love sports. I love them. And I remember driving home, thinking to myself, universe. You know, self, I'm going to one day leave Morgan Stanley and go manage money for baseball players. And then I did leave Morgan Stanley, and I, and but I, I really had no idea how my life would encounter baseball players. You know, I, I, of course, I had a neighbor, Dayton Moore, and then another neighbor moved in, Ian Kennedy, and I had this pipe in that one of them would become my client one day. But it was actually even better than that. The idea was that I had to help someone selflessly. And that person wound up becoming my apprentice who became, you know, I, I could, he calls me, John calls me my, his boss. I think of his, him as my partner. But, um, mm. but now John has brought on, uh, he brought on his first, uh, his first client, uh, Dustin Hull was a catcher for Triple Lake, Colorado Springs, and he plays for the, you know, through the Brewers organization. And once that happened, I was like, wow, my dream came true. My firm, Satya, now manages money for baseball players. And none of that would have happened without Jonathan Perrin. But prerequisite for that is none of that would have happened if I didn't give selflessly. So I think that the idea that whether you're helping your parents or your siblings or your friends or better yet, strangers, um, mm-hmm. that's when, you know, I always say when I, when I notice bad behavior on a baseball field, I'll do a tweet on Twitter and say, baseball God's always watching, you know, the idea that <laughs> the, the yeah. way that we behave is, is, we, is being watched and there is karma and how we treat ourselves and how we treat others. I don't know if it's some kind of mathematical, not mathematical algorithm they have up there in heaven, but, but the karma must be balanced out. And so when you can create lots of good karma for yourself, then it, it, you'll be, you know, you'll be, you know, overwhelmed with blessings as it comes back around to you because karma is very, very real. And you don't have to always think of it in reverse. I, I, e, I created bad karma. Now I got to pay it off. Don't even start that way. Just create good karma and then watch how it flows back to you because of the idea that giving really is magical would be my, my, uh, my, my gift to the P-Head community. And by the, by the way, uh, my favorite band still to this day, I, of course, Bruce Springsteen's not a band. My favorite band is still Fish. And of course, Fish, yes. Fish fans are called Fish Heads. And so I've been a Fish Head for a very, very long time. So it really feel, it feels very natural to me to be a, a P-Head as well. So fair enough. Yes. Good stuff. 
<laughs> you are officially a pee. You are officially a pee head. See well what said. I did there? I like um, that. <laughs> I love fish too, by the way. My, my partner is obsessed with fish and has gotten oh, me very right into on. fish. Uh, yeah. So, um, well, thank you for that advice. And that's absolutely, um, that's absolutely right. And, and I, I was just thinking as you were describing that, I was thinking about all the times in my life when, yeah, I've actually like just been really inspired to give, not because I thought it was going to get me something, but just inspired in the moment. Like, oh, I really feel attracted to this person. Or like, I really want to help this person. I really want to be a part of, you know, them. And it's always in those moments that I think our heart is the most open and that we're, and that like, I just mentioned we're, we're, we're acting off of inspiration, right? Not off of tactics, not off of strategy, not off of like what our, our brain is saying. Well, if you do this, then you can get this. It's like our heart is giving us an inspired. Yes, well said. Yeah. And so that always leads to, to the right place. So that is great advice. Thank you for that. My um, pleasure. Yeah. So, um, well, before we head to like the last question or two, um, where can people get your book and where can people check you out? Yeah, sure. Well, I'm, I'm on Twitter at Scooter Fink, and anyone can welcome to find me uh, on Facebook at Jonathan Fink. And my book, Baseball Gods Are Real, uh, I'm grateful to say it's actually available everywhere. You can get it on Amazon.com. You can get it on BarnesandNoble.com. Uh, you also can get it at physical Barnes and Noble stores, although not every store will, will have it. For example, in Leewood, Kansas, where I live, I'm doing a book signing on October 27th at four o'clock Saturday. Shout out to anyone in Leewood who wants to come join me. But, you know, th- that, that store has, you know, a ton of my books on, on, uh, on the shelves. Um, one of the things I'll be doing here in LA is actually meeting with uh, managers of the local stores here to convince them to also carry my book. The point if someone were to go into a Barnes and Noble store and my book is not there, they can request it and they can they can order it from there. But for most people, it's easier to get on your Kindle, get on your Amazon, you know, get on Amazon or, or BarnesandNobles.com. Awesome, thank you. Um, and let's see. So here's the fun question: Do you have any? And you've already given us you've already given <laughs> us so many of these, but. As something outside the book, do you have any fun or inspiring manifestation stories or stories of synchronicities? Anything maybe that's happened recently or just something? Yeah, well, well there you yeah. go. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share one that just happened with, with me, you, and my daughter, Kayla. Okay? Awesome. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, cool. so this, this is fun. Yeah. So, so numerology is something that I knew nothing about until I started my spiritual path. Um, but they, if you start watching enough YouTube videos, numerology becomes very prominent in your life once you start tapping into, you know, the, the to, to source, to Holy Spirit, whatever you want to call it. So when my daughter was a little, a little kid, um, our number together was 808. What happened is I would be reading to her at bed at night and she would look over at her little electrical clock. And when the, when it was 808 PM, uh, at night, you, you know, you can't really look closely. You can't really tell if the zero was a zero or an eight because you can sort of see the eight behind the zero. And she, she always kind of made fun of how the numbers are confused. Using. And, you know, when it goes from 807 to 808, that's when, you know, it looks weird. And so 808, it kind of became our number. And anytime that I see 808 on a clock or she does, whether we're together in the same house or even, you know, somewhere else, I'll get a text from Kayla saying 808, love you. And so 808, love you has always been, been our thing. Now, by the way, my daughter, um, we, we do yoga together every day. We go to the gym all the time together. And she has been seeing numerology now. Um, more and more so much so that I might p- publish a book for her of her numerology because she sees the number 822 all the time. And just kind of a side note, I Googled it and I found out that 822 is what's called an angel number, i.e. The, the idea that she's an earth angel and uh, angels of, of, from beyond the veil are giving her a wink saying, you know, keep doing what you're doing. You're doing the right thing. You know, she's an amazing kid. She's a 14-year-old vegan and she does yoga. I mean, she's, she's an old soul. She's, she's amazing. Well, anyway, so 808's always been our number. And I, when I had this podcast with you, I wanted to mail you the book. And I picked up, I picked up from school at high school every day. And so I picked her up from high school and I just said, hey, Kayla, I just got to go to the post office. I got to mail Alexa this book. And so, um, so sure enough, when uh, we got to the, uh, got, got to the, uh, the, the desk and I was filling out the information, and I put your apartment number, your apartment number was 808. And my daughter yes. says to me, dad, look, 808, I love you. And I was like, <laughs> wow. You know, cause here I am, you know, I'm so yeah. excited for this podcast. It's fulfilling my life destiny, writing this book and sharing this message. And then as I'm sending you the book, the number 808 pops up and my daughter was there to witness it. And it was like, wow, 808, I love you. Just so, so blessed. So yeah. So uh, we, synchronicity with numerology is really big in our family now. And whenever we see numbers, it's, we always get a good, a good giggle for sure. I love that. And I love hearing you tell it uh, again, it, cause 
you know, you messaged me about it and you sent me the cutest picture of you and your daughter, like, <laughs> set, like at the post office with the number. And I like, I've always joked about the number of my apartment too. I'm always like, oh, it's 808 and Heartbreaks or 808, like, because it's like, and it's a music reference, you know, like 808 no drum. Kidding. Eight oh eight drum. That. Yeah, huh. it's uh, and it's one of Kanye West's albums, eight oh eight and heartbreak. What? Um, oh my god, my my daughter's gonna hear that and she's gonna like, go over here. That's crazy. <laughs> yeah, and there's actually like a headphone company uh, called eight oh eight, and like it's it's all like music related. So oh, I always thought of it Lord. that way, but it's so funny when you sent me that. I was like, oh my gosh, because I like I I love my apartment number too. So that's uh, it's amazing. That's so beautiful. You just blew my so blessed right to be now. a part that was of it. Amazing, beautiful, so good. Yes, yeah, so good, so good. It keeps unfolding. Um. Well, Jonathan, thank you so much for just, uh, you know, being a part of this show. And like I said, you know, taking just doing what you're doing, because I think it's really important. I actually, you know, I got your like I said, I have your book and I read half of it just in one sitting and then I left it on the kitchen table. And then my partner came home, who's also a practice. What did you call your wife? A practical skeptic. A, 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 prag- a pragmatic skeptic. A pragmatic yeah. <laughs> skeptic. He is also the same way. And he came home and he, I just hear him go, the baseball gods are real. What's this? <laughs> I was like, yeah. oh, you into it? And he was like, well, what's it about? I'm like, it's baseball. And, you know, so I, I was like, oh, like right there, you're really already kind of appealing to people in a yes, whole new dude, way. And, 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 and here's what's so funny. The Trojan horse for him will be fish because there's a lot of fish references throughout my whole yes. book. I love it. Exactly, exactly, exactly. There's so much crossover. And I just, I think it's really important for, you know, people who feel the call like you to really approach storytelling and spirituality in this way of, you know, mixing in other interests, because spirituality isn't just spirituality. I think like a lot of the times, even I can get this way, like I get so into it that it almost seems like it's its own thing. But really, spirituality overlaps and overlays with everything in life. You know what I mean? It's just kind of a filter, just a perspective. So um, congratulations on the book and just for doing what you're doing and good luck on the rest of your book tour. Uh, is there anything else you feel called to share before we sign off? Yeah, one more thing. You guys, okay. you and Brandon are terrific and I'm grateful for the interview and you guys keep doing what you're doing because you're, you're really doing, you know, you're spreading that love and light, you're doing God's work and I'm so proud of you guys and when I first discovered your podcast, I thought, wow, we're really entering a new age um, and I'm just so excited to be part of it. So thank you for having me and, uh, and God bless. Oh, thank you so much. All right, Jonathan, until next time. You guys take care. Be well. (laughs) Bye-bye. Bye. That's it for this week's episode. If you're a listener with a story to share and are interested in being featured on a future episode of this special series, you can email me at alexa at positivehead.com. Also, if you're craving more consciousness-elevating content, be sure to check out Gaia, which is the go-to source for streaming consciousness content on the web, where you can stream an incredible 7,000-plus exclusive videos covering 5,000 years of wisdom. As you all hear Brandon constantly say, it's a daily conscious effort to maintain an elevated vibration, and if you're looking to journey deep down the rabbit hole to do so, then Gaia is the best place we know of to do it period. And you can sign up for your first month for only 99 cents at Gaia.com slash positive head. That's spelled G-A-I-A dot com slash positive head. Check it out. Otherwise, tune in next Friday for another P-Head Posse episode. And until then, as Brandon always says, journey well.